Jaya Prabhuji. We're continuing our study of the Ishavasya Upanishad and we are still debating on the question how can Idam and Adaha, which we said is the object and the, the subject and object, how can they be one? How can they have the same nature and how is that possible? And to do that, I actually found something in Mantra 16 of the, of the commentary. And it's a very interesting idea. And we will have to go into a little bit of uh, the story of the allegory of the cave of Plato. And also something that Heidegger writes about it. And only then we can understand what Prabhuji is saying. But first let us... Uh, Let's read what Prabhuji says and how that is connected to our topic. Throughout history, many have misinterpreted the teachings of great non-dualistic masters. They have made the mistake of thinking that Vedantic teachings say that objects do not exist. The great Upanishadic sages of antiquity did not deny the existence of objects, but maintained that objects cannot exist independently from consciousness. This should not be confused with Plato's orthotes or the, correct, the correction of re representation. So, as we said in the invocation, uh, that we have the separation between subject and object. And we say that the essence is Purnam, is one thing. And here Prabhuji is, to is approaching it from a different angle because he's talking about like how usually that is misunderstood when Vedanta says that, that objects do not exist. And he brings this, this term, orthotes, and from Plato. And to understand what it is, it might refer to, a, it's probably referring to a, an article by Martin Heidegger with, titled Plato's Doctrine of Truth, where Heidegger, in this, in this um, article, he goes in and he, he analyzes, he dissects the story, the allegory of the cave, the famous allegory of the cave of, of Plato. And he does that in order to understand the idea of truth. How is that referring to truth? And so, and, and then he st speaks about this term in Greek, orthotes. So in order to understand the term and to understand how is all that related to what Prabhuji said, we first need to go into the, uh, what Heidegger says and understand that. And in order to understand what Heidegger says, we need to understand the allegory of the cave. So in the allegory of the cave, what Pro Plato uh, portrays is saying, imagine a place a cave that's under the ground and in that cave there's like a wall and there are prisoners who are tied to the wall and they are tied in a way that they can't move their heads and they can't move their feet or anything and so they are forced to stare directly directly in front of them and what they see in front of them is is a wall now behind them there are people who are passing a with different objects, like kind of like a, like a, when you see like a, um, puppeteers, like holding puppets. And behind them, there is a fire, a big fire. So the fire casts light and the things that those people are, are carrying cast shadows onto the wall that the people are seeing. So the, all the thing that people are, those prisoners are seeing is those shadows on the wall. And also, there's an echo in the cave. So when those people who are carrying all these objects pass and, and talk among each other, the echo makes the prisoner think that they are hearing the shadows. Now, there is prisoners, Plato says, they are there from birth. So all they know is those shadows because from the, mi the day that they were born, they were forced to look at the, this wall. And so what they think is they think that those shadows are the reality. Those, those 
figures that they are seeing, they think they are real and they are speaking. They don't realize the, con the, the situation that they are in. Now, Plato continues and he says that then one of these prisoners is freed and also he's forced, he's forced to stand up and turn to look at the light. And so he sees the light of, the, of this fire and in the beginning that's very difficult. The light is, is, is a person that lived all his life in the cave so he's used to shadows, he's not used to light and that light is difficult on him. So it pains his eyes, it takes him time to adjust. And not only that, that prisoner is then dragged out of the cave. And eventually he gets out of the cave into the outside world where there is sun and then, you know, all the things. And he starts looking and starts seeing the things as they are. He starts seeing, you know, trees and forests and, and, and water and streams and he sees all the things that are outside until eventually he starts seeing the sun itself which is very significant as we will see later. And this is a very painful process. Eventually Plato says that he's looking at a, the sun itself and he knows the sun. And then what he realizes is obviously that this, what he is seeing now, is real and those shadows that he saw all his life is not real. And then it's not, doesn't end there because the, the, the Plato describes that this prisoner is taken back into the cave and back together with those fellow prisoners that he was sitting with before and he's trying to tell them what he saw, what he discovered. And of course they don't see that because they're still tied and still see only shadows so they don't believe him and they think that he's you know lying and they, Plato said that he might become even violent and, and aggressive toward them. <clears throat> and if we read a bit from, from the Republic what Plato says Next, says I, compare our nature in respect of education and its lack of to such an experience as this. Picture men dwelling in this sort of sub subterranean cavern. Here he is actually starting to describe uh, the, the cave. But the interesting thing is that for Plato, uh, he brings this story in order to he first brings the story and then he explains himself why he's bringing the story. And he's the, he bringing the story because here he explains, and not only here, but he, this is another place where he's explained his famous doctrine of the world of ideas, where according to this, uh, to this view that Plato has, everything that we see, every object, we know it because in the world of ideas, the intellectual world, there is the idea of that thing, the perfect idea of that thing. So if I see a tree, I know it's a tree because in the world of ideas, there is that idea tree. And in Greek, uh, the word idea, which sounds the same as in English, uh, similar, has a few meanings. One of them is idea, like idea, notion, what we think about it, but another one is form. So in, in a way, the real form of the thing is the idea, is in the intellectual world. So in the allegory of the cave, what Plato is saying is that what we see here, what we experience as the world, is like those prisoners. It, we see what we think we see as real is actually shadows. It's not, it's not the real world. The real world exists in the ideal world, in the intellectual realm. And he describes what happens to that prisoner, that as he's freed and he goes, in the beginning he sees just the fire, but then he's dragged out and he starts seeing things outside until he's seeing the sun itself. He's describing the process of discovering the truth until he sees the ultimate truth, which is the sun. And 
Plato writes itself. Then this entire allegory, I said, you may now append, dear Glaucon, to the previous argument. The prison house is the world of sight. The light of the fire is the sun. And you will not misapprehend me if you interpreted the journey upwards to be the ascent of the soul into the intellectual world. This is Plato explaining himself his allegory. This is a very beautiful story and we can talk about it a lot. However, in the context of what Heidegger writes in his article, so first he, he brings the entire uh, story of the cave and then he starts analyzing it. And he points to a very interesting a point. Heidegger says, in the allegory, the things that are visible in the daylight outside the cave, where sight is free to look at everything, are a concrete illustration of the ideas. According to Plato, if people did not have these ideas in view, that is to say, the respective appearance of things, living things, beings, humans, numbers, gods, they would never be able to perceive this or that as a house, as a tree, as a god. So Heidegger is explaining again Plato and he's saying like that, and this might sound a, a weird idea, that I cannot know something if, if there was not this idea in the uh, intellectual world. So, and, and, and this is, and Heidegger says, if the idea didn't exist, according to Plato, you would not be able to know anything because you would not be able to know that this is a house, this is a tree, this is a cat, nothing. Because you have to have the, the idea in the ideal world. <clears throat> and Plato claims here and in other places that the knowledge, even simple knowledge as we say, comes from within the soul, not from something external. Uh, which, which sounds weird because we think uh, that knowledge, like if I don't know, for example, how to, uh, I don't know history, I open a book or I go to a class and I get the information and, you know, I get more knowledge and now I know that history that I didn't know before. Plato is saying, no, the knowledge comes from inside. The process is to allow this knowledge to appear. But the knowledge is in the soul. And uh, he's showing it in various uh, of his um, uh, discourses. There's in, in the dialogue Meno, there's a, a story where Socrates uh, is teaching a, a young boy uh, something about geometry. So he asks him how to do something and then the, the child, the, the young boy, gets it wrong. And then he starts asking him questions. And through these questions, he's showing that the boy actually finds eventually the, the answer, the correct answer. And it's not that Socrates gave him the answer. He allowed the answer to appear from from this boy himself, like he, he understood it himself through those act, through those questions. So, and then he sh is like showing with that, that knowledge comes from within the soul. <clears throat> so for Plato, knowing knowledge, knowing the truth means a movement of the soul in, in the direction of the light. Like that prisoner who is actually dragged, he's not like willingly going, he's dragged to see the, the, the sun. And for, for Plato, because the story, the allegory of the cave is inside the context of a much bigger discussion, the whole discussion about the Republic. And in the, and the, in the Republic, and very briefly, it's Plato's idea of an ideal city, an ideal society. And in here, he's actually getting to the education of the leaders of that society. So the whole education, so, so, so the allegory of the cave, and if we notice the first line, uh, when, when uh, Plato starts, he says, next says I, compare our nature in respect of education. He's talking about education.
more than talking about truth and all that stuff, he's, he's talking about education. He's trying to show the process of this, how, how the knowledge comes in. And <clears throat> Heidegger it's, explains that. The allegory of the cave concentrates its explanatory power on making us able to see and know the essence by means of concrete images recounted in the story. At the same time, Plato seeks to avoid false interpretations. He wants to show that the essence of education does not consist in merely pouring knowledge into the unprepared soul, as if some container held out empty and waiting. On the contrary, genuine education takes hold of our very soul and transforms it in its entirety by first of all leading us to the place of our essential being and, and accustoming us to it. What Heidegger is explaining, and it's actually what Plato is also saying, is that this whole allegory is really about education. And this education, as we said, is very different from what we understand uh, today, the common understanding of what education is. The common understanding of what education is today, if you look at the you know, dictionary definition, is a process of receiving or giving instructions, you know, at the school, especially at school or university. And we, we, we think about it as like, you, you know, children go knowing nothing into this institution and they come out at the other end after six years or 12 years or whatever, knowing things they acquired in education. But for Plato, it's something completely different. It's this discovery of a truth that was always been hidden inside the soul and people are not aware of it. It has to be unhidden, okay? And unhidden is a very important term. And Heidegger goes into the Greek words and explains them. And in Greek, and this is what Heidegger says, in Greek, unhiddenness is called aletheia and the word that translate that we translate as truth so the word truth that is used in greek in the allegory of the cave when when the prisoner is going and discovering all these things is aletheia and aletheia means something not hidden so heidegger shows in these articles that because Plato comes from this point that he's talking about education, and there, so it means there is a strong connection for Plato between education and truth. And, truth. <clears throat> and it's demonstrated by the levels. There's like a grad, gradual uh, going between one level and another of the prisoner that every time he goes through more unhiddenness. Of, of truth. He discovers first that the, the shadows are, you know, that what he thought as, as a real object is actually shadows. That's the first thing he discovers. Then he discovers there's a, a light inside the cave. And then he is, but that's just one level of unhiddenness, you can say. Then he's taking out and he starts seeing, you know, the, the world outside, the trees, the birds, and that's even more unhidden than before. And then eventually it gets to the sun, which is the most unhidden. Okay. And Heidegger writes, thus the fulfillment of the essence of education can be achieved only in the region of, and on the basis of, the most unhidden, the truest, the truth in the proper sense. The essence of education is grounded in the essence of truth. <clears throat> and Heidegger writes here that it's based on the most unhidden, the truest, because in for Plato, uh, he writes, there is, again, the context of what the allegory of the cave is. It's in, in book six of the Republic, at the end, he has another simile where he ex uh, explains that there is the highest idea, the good he says the ultimate good. That's how he calls it. And he compares it to the sun. He says the sun is actually what allows us to see everything. 
because if there was no sun, we couldn't see anything, right? So he's saying, we see all the objects that we see, everything that we know is because of the sun. And so the same, in the same way, everything that you know is because of one ultimate idea, which is the idea of the good, the ultimate good. So the idea of this ultimate good is why the prisoner, when he is freed and he dis is going through this process of more unhiddenness, more unhiddenness, more truth, more truth, until he sees the sun, which is the most unhidden. He gets to the peak. There's nothing more than that. He, he And he's seeing the sun itself. He's not seeing a reflection of the sun. He's actually looking at the sun itself. That was the, the story of the cave. And Heidegger writes, the allegory of the cave was written in order to illustrate the answer, which is set forth in, the, in an image. The sun, as a source of light, lends visibility to whatever is seen. But seeing sees what is visible only insofar as the eye is sun-like by having the power to participate in the sun kind of essence, that is, its shining. The eye itself emits light and devotes itself to the shining and in, in this way is able to receive and apprehend whatever appears. In terms of what is at stake, the image signifies a relationship that Plato expresses as follows. Thus, what provides unhiddenness to the thing known and also gives the power of knowing to the knower, this, I say, is the idea of the good. Now we start getting to closer to, to see why, why Heidegger goes into this topic at all. And we have to understand this, that... Plato's that world, uh, concept of the idea that we need to have the idea in order to know something is not only that that if I see a book because it's because there is an idea of the book that is true but not only that eventually there is the I highest idea the truest of the truth and that idea is what enables all the other ideas to be known okay so this the good what Plato calls the good it's not good like morally good. It's also that, but not only. It's also good because it enables us to know everything else. And here is where Heidegger starts seeing something more into the story something very fascinating and see what he says but is it not the case that the allegory of the cave deals especially with aletheia truth and hiddenness absolutely not this is heidegger says he says no we think until now we thought that we're talking about truth discovering the truth okay the prisoner who is com starts being completely in illusion seeing something that is nothing to do with reality. He's seeing some shadows and he's convinced this is reality. And he goes and discovers, oh no, this is actually a shadow. And then he discovers, wait, there's actually people and there's things and there's an outside world that I didn't know about. And then there's the sun itself, which gives light to everything. So we think, oh, this allegory of the cave is talking about truth because he discovers the truth and he's discovering more truth at each step of the way. And now Heidegger saying, no. He's saying, is the case that the allegory of the cave deals especially with Aletheia? Absolutely not. And yet the fact remains that this allegory contains Plato's doctrine of truth. For the allegory is grounded in the unspoken event whereby idea gains dominance over aletheia, over truth. He points to something unsaid, namely that henceforth the essence of truth does not, as the essence of unhiddenness, unfold from its proper and essential fullness, but rather shifts to the essence of the idea. The essence of truth gives up its fundamental trait of unhiddenness. What is he talking about? 
what what Heidegger is trying to say. <clears throat> He's saying that we might thought in the beginning that we're talking about truth and the search for truth, because the prisoner, as we said, goes through this whole process from seeing what is hidden to unhidden. But Heidegger is like reading between the lines and he's saying, no, we're mistaken because it's more important that the person goes and sees the sun. He goes to see the idea of the good, the utmost idea. They know that's the point. There it's like a, a, a path that leads to a very specific destination. If our comportment with beings is always and everywhere a matter of the idea of the idea, the seeing of the visible form, then all our efforts must be concentrated above all on making such seeing possible. And that requires the correct vision. Truth becomes orthotes, the correctness of apprehending and asserting. Here's that word that we were looking for in the beginning, orthotes. It's a word that means like rightness, correctness, or also like upright posture, like erectness. And, and Heidegger says, this is what truth has become. We, although the, 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 the story began with talking about aletheia, unhiddenness, but actually what he's meaning is this term, orthotes. What is he talking about? He means that it's not just a, th a search for truth. It's a search to see something very specific. The person is not like, okay, just like, okay, now you go out of the cave and you start seeing the world and you start discovering who knows what. No. He goes out of the cave, he sees things, but eventually he sees the sun, that I, one big main idea idea of the all ideas, who that idea allows him to see everything. So what he means, what Heidegger says is that the person needs to see in the right way, in, in certain way. And in the, in the allegory of the cave, we actually have this, that the prisoner is taken and forced to look at the, at the light. He's forced to look at the sun. He's actually complaining. He, he doesn't go willingly. They have to force him to take him and, and force him to see the light. So this correctness of vision means that the tr the, you can only, if you want to, accord in the platonic uh, point of view, if you want to know the truth, you have to look at that specific thing. You have to see that ultimate good, not anything, just that good. Okay, so, so fine. So let's say Heidegger is right and he's actually talking about orthotes instead of aletheia. He's talking about correct view instead of actually finding the truth. What does it matter? Why is it so important? And it's important because he... Heidegger is trying to show us something about the way we think about truth. And <clears throat> now, I don't think anyone actually takes Plato's view literally as is and think this is actually the case. That there is somewhere in world of ideas where if I see of, that there is an idea for everything, so there's an idea of the ideal tr uh, tree or idea cat and the reason I, I'm able to know is because that idea exists. But, and, and, and then there's the idea of the, the highest idea of the good, which is the one idea that allows to know everything and all that knowledge exists inside the soul already. Probably no one th really thinks that's the case. However, what Heidegger says, is that there is something in the way we think about truth that is in, in its source in this view of Plato. And what he means is that truth is correctness because what is between what is seen and what is considered. 
and see what Heidegger writes here. From now on, this characterization of the essence of truth as the correctness of both representation and assertion becomes normative for the whole of Western thinking. He's saying like, all of the Western thinking, all of which is our way of thinking, is in this way. What does it mean? <clears throat> and then he goes on and he goes to actually point out and he brings different other thinkers of, of the Western tradition throughout history. And he's showing us that they are also thinking about truth in this way. And he's, he's quoting, and I'll give these quotes. He quotes from Aristotle, who says, In fact, the false and the true are not in things themselves, but in the understanding. Then he brings Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas says, Truth is properly encountered in the intellect, whether human or divine. Then he brings Descartes, and Descartes says, Truth or falsehood, in the proper sense, can be nowhere else but in the intellect alone. And then he brings Nietzsche. Truth is a kind of error without which a certain kind of living being could not live. In the final analysis, the value for life is what is decisive. <clears throat> so Heidegger brings all these examples and he's bringing these examples to show that what we think is truth is when is something actually very, very simple. He's saying, if I see something and the, if I have the, the idea that I have in my mind are the same, it's truth. Okay, so if I see a cat and I have the idea of a cat and I say, this is a cat, that's true. But if, I, if there is there a cat, and, and what I see, and I say it's an elephant, that's obviously not true. And he's saying all this Western thought is that correctness of what is seen and what is considered. And that is orthotes. Now, now we can come back to the text of Prabhuji and read again what we started and how we, we got to this, to this whole discussion. The great Upanishadic sages of antiquity did not deny the existence of objects, but maintain that objects cannot exist independently from consciousness. This should not be confused with Plato orthotes, the correction of representation. That is to say, even though objects cannot exist independently, it does not mean that formless matter only acquires form on the ideatic plane. Things lack independent existence and are perceived as separate only because of relationships with them. Relationships lead to diversity, which is an immediate consequence of thought. From this text, we can see that there is some similarity between the Upanishadic view and Plato's view, but there's also a very big difference. The similarity is that we see that objects are not independent. So in Plato's view, the objects cannot exist independently from the world of ideas and mainly from that idea of the good. You remember, because that idea of the good is that idea that gives us the ability to know everything else. So without it, all the act of knowing is impossible. And, and so, what that, in other words, what Plato is saying is that the being of all the objects depends on the ideas. Nothing can exist without this world of ideas. And so the, the, the ideas are linked to the objects. And like Heidegger says, the idea is what really is important for Plato. It's important to understand and to re 
discover that idea, of, especially the idea of the good, that's what really is important. That's what education is all about. All this process is to get to know that idea. Because after that, you go down back into the world and you are able to, you know, guide everyone else because you know the, the, the truth. Now Prabhuji, what he says, is that objects cannot exist independently from consciousness. So you would think it's the same, it's not. The difference is is huge because for Plato, the, the diversity that we see, we, we see a lot of trees, right? They all, it's because they're all linked to one idea, the original idea of the, of the, the, uh, the pure idea of the tree. So in a way, like the shadows, they signal something. They signal that the idea must be out there, even if you're not seeing it. The prisoner who, who still was not freed does not see, but what Plato is saying, like, know that if what you see, because there is an idea there, so know that the idea exists. The fact that you're actually able to see those shadows is proof that the idea is there. Because if the idea was not there, you won't be able to know anything and you won't be able to see the shadows. So the fact that we see diversity is a proof that the idea is, exists. But Prabhuji, on the other hand, says that objects are perceived as separate only because of relationships with them. So they are perceived as separate. They, there is the perceived diversity because of a relationship. And what that brings us to the question, what is a relationship? So a relationship, for a relationship to exist, you need to have two agents that have some kind of contact between them in some way. A relationship can be infinite, in infinite ways, infinite forms. It can be a close relationship, it can be a distant relationship, it can be short, long, last for a second, or a lifetime. But it's always a connection between two or more entities. But what we can see is that a relationship has no necessary relation to truth. Truth is not a requirement to have a relationship. So, all this movement that that Heidegger was showing us in the story of going from t toward that that good that which is the correct view orthotes is actually irrelevant for a relationship because it, for a relationship it doesn't matter if your view is correct or not it, a relationship can be can be in, come from a totally desperate dream of someone who is, you know, out of his mind, seeing who is totally delusional, seeing all kind of illusions. Or it can be a very calculative, scientific, and, you know, trying to be as truthful as possible. It doesn't matter. It's still a relationship. Both are relationships. Both are movements of thoughts. And that, that means a lot because, you know, in one of, the, of those quotes that Heidegger was giving us, one of them is really, really significant for this discussion, that the one of Descartes, truth or falsehood in the proper sense can be nowhere but in the intellect alone, in the intellect, in the mind. So we, we started this whole thing about this discussion that we have. How can we know if what the, the Upanishad, what the, the Ishavasi Upanishad is, is telling us in the invocation is a statement that seems totally untrue to us because it goes against everything that we experience. He's saying that the subject and object are one. And this is something that cannot we we tried, we went through different uh, points of view, and we will continue going through different points of view. And we see that, logically, this doesn't make any sense. How can a subject and an object be one thing? And what we're seeing here 
if the truth of something is in the intellect, in the mind, and we're trying to bring this Upanishadic idea of idam and adaha, the subject and object, to be as purnam, to be one essence, we try to bring it in the mind. It doesn't work. It, do, it doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> but if we look at this diversity of objects, which is the very essence of, of all this discussion that we have, we see many, many things. And I, it's like, we feel there's me here, the subject, and there's objects there, and there's many objects. But if we see them as a relationship, like Prabhuji, Prabhuji is saying, a relationship, a relationship doesn't have to be true. It has no connection to truth. And so the, the way we are thinking about the whole thing is wrong, according to the Upanishadic view. The Upanishadic view is not interested in a truth where the, there is correctness, orthotes, between what you see and what you think about. Prabhuji writes, Relationships, duality, thought, and language are reflections of the mind. Therefore, objects and things are synonymous with thoughts and ideas. Objects are synonymous with thoughts and ideas. It sounds like what Plato is saying, but no. Because the very defin for definition of something into an object the differentiating of one object into another is a product of thinking of an idea. But what Prabhuji is actually getting at is that is that definition, is that diversity of different objects real? Real not in the sense that I see an object, it fits the idea of object that I have in the mind and therefore I feel that this is true, that I'm really seeing what I think I'm seeing. He's saying, think about truth more like aletheia, as unhiddenness. What, is unhe what can be unhidden in this view? If we break the way we see the reality, observe it, go not as thoughts and ideas, because he's saying all these things are thoughts and ideas, these are relationships, without a relationship. What can we discover? What can be actually aletheia, actually unhidden? We will continue to discuss this in more further classes. Jai Prabhuji.